afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to At the Table with Tom and Eric, a show about the people who play games and something else. Oh, no, just no, about that. No, that's generally it. That's really it. Sorry, the line went off my page here. You know what, Eric? Just, I need, I'm going to write my own intros. Welcome. There you go. Uh, and, and welcome from me as well. I'm Eric Summerer. Our guest at the table today is the designer of Specter Ops, the Century Series, Foundations of Rome, and a lot more. Uh, he's also a professor of game design at NYU, and I'm delighted he's here to hang out with us. Everybody, welcome Emerson Matsuchi. Hi, Emerson. Hello, thank you for having me. Someone in chat just said that they're playing Tricks and Treats tonight in honor of Halloween, which was Emerson's first game, so this is very apro, um, whatever the rest of that phrase is, uh, for Emerson to be here, so we're glad you're here. Happy spooky yeah, Halloween. Awesome. What are you dressed as? Oh, what am I dressed as? Uh, can you take a guess? Yeah. Uh, one of the it's prep guys good. from a frat movie, the one that all the frat guys beat up. You know, the, like, Animal House? No, that's my real life. But, uh, no, actually, the, I'm dressed as one of the characters from a video game called Persona 5. Ah. You, you saw that some folks had asked about that, and, uh, and, and you anticipated the question, and you are dressed as your answer, I'm assuming. Oh, actually, it's more like today's Halloween, and my kids just had a Halloween parade at school. So I was dressed with this because the other parents also dressed up so this was my sort of my halloween costume did the kids and recognize so I just came you back from that i'm sorry Tom. did the kids recognize you um probably not <laughs> okay because i was well, joking you guys didn't i didn't even know you were dressed up either i know nothing about persona 5 i'm not even talking about your costume all right um what why i don't understand folks tomorrow <laughs> at noon uh, Dice Tower East registration goes live. You want to come. It's going to be amazing. Um, come on out and join us this coming July. Tickets sold out last year, so don't delay. Also, if you would like merchandise for Dice Tower, you can find it at DiceTowerStore.com. All right, that's enough announcements. Let's get to Eric and this part of the show with my favorite <laughs> designer. Uh, well, you know, we should we should talk right off the bat. You mentioned uh, tricks and treats as Emerson's first design, and and I kind of wanted to know what about Halloween inspired you for your first ever foray into game design. Oh, you know, um, Halloween was always my favorite holiday when I was younger. It was always my favorite holiday. Uh, now that I have a family, it's you know Thanksgiving and Christmas have taken the spot of being my favorite, but Halloween has always been. My favorite holiday for a very very long time so thought it was appropriate that my first game would be a halloween themed game let me ask you this emerson and sure. eric you too halloween is fun as a kid but was halloween a four-day holiday when we were kids because i do not remember this very <laughs> lengthy 600 different trick-or-treat events no i certainly don't remember that um i i also it's very big, uh, at least in some of the communities around here, to have Halloween on a day that's not Halloween. Like, they'll move it to be the nearest weekend day, and, and that seems weird to me. I just remember whether Halloween was a Tuesday or not, i just go, and that would be the day you went out trick-or-treating. That's, that's interesting. I was up in Connecticut um, about two weeks ago, so or two weekends ago, uh, so I was in Eric's neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, as we were coming, my daughter, I went up with my daughter, and we noticed that everyone was dressed up and everyone was trick or treating, and I panicked a little bit, thinking that I had just gone through like a time portal, and I ended up a week and like ten days <laughs> after afterwards. But no, it's it's true that a lot of places do do a Halloween trick or treating event on a day that's different than uh, the thirty first. So you are in New York City, correct, Emerson? Correct, yes. Uh, well, did you? Actually, technically, I'm in Long Island. I'm just two miles off the edge of New York City. Okay. Close enough to be considered in New York City. Uh, did you grow up in the area? Is that where you're from? No, no. Uh, I actually, <laughs> uh, I was actually born on the West Coast. So I was born in California. Uh, I grew up in Las Vegas. So that's where I spent most of my life is in Las Vegas. 
where Dice Tower West is. Indeed. Uh, and where uh, Chris E. Uh, is from as well. Uh, so what, what brought you out to the East Coast? Oh, okay. I slowly made my migration to the East Coast because I went to university in Pittsburgh. So that was a, a, a big trek to the East. Uh, and then I moved to New... After uh, college, I moved to New Jersey uh, when I got my first job working in New York. Uh, then, I, then I moved to Manhattan. Then after that, I got married, moved to Brooklyn. And then now I'm in Long Island. So I'm constantly moving East. So eventually I'll be living in the UK, then maybe France and, and so forth. <laughs> yes. so that's where my current trajectory is leading. Stop over in Maine first. That could that could work as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what what is your uh, what is your day job or what has been your day job? What'd you go to school for? Oh, actually, it was uh, software development. So I was a computer science major, and software development was uh, my career. My initial career was actually web design because in the '90s it was a big thing. Uh, there was a lot of demand yes. for. Uh, People who knew how to do web design, web graphics, web hosting, all that stuff. So that was my first foray into um, getting a professional job in the technology industry. Uh, eventually, I started. I um, worked for a large financial firm, so I was doing a lot of software development for large financial firms, and that's what I did for a good amount of time. So I was working uh, around the Wall Street area for about ten or so years there. It seems like something about the Wall Street uh, industry drives people to game design and game publishing. <laughs> <laughs> Some something about that industry says, you know what? I need a creative outlet, and this is where I'm headed. What what made you? Uh, what pushed you toward? Uh -oh. Well, we're gonna always wonder, Emerson, what pushed you towards what? Um, so. I'm not sure why Eric froze there, but we'll yeah. say what pushed you into designing more than just a card game, I'm sure Eric would have said. Oh, okay. Well, I think I've always wanted to make games, so games are always a very big part of my life. Um, and so even while I was uh, uh, doing software development, I, in my spare time, I would just kind of um, think up different games and uh, just play some games in my head while I play some video games. So I think I think there was always a part of me that always wanted to create games. I just didn't pursue it to any like serious capacity until um, when I when I started working on that Halloween theme game. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, um, Halloween theme game. Um, and when I explain the game to people, I would have to say it's a Halloween theme game, but it's not based on the Halloween movie uh, with the same name. But fun, strangely enough, uh, I'm actually working on a Halloween theme game based on the 1978 movie. So it's kind of come full circle now. So do you like horror movies then? I do enjoy horror movies. I wouldn't say I'm a horror aficionado. So, but it is something that... Um, uh, that after I was approached, I would um, what I would generally do with projects where I've approached to do work on an IP is that before I commit to the project, I want to make sure that I'm a fan of that IP as well. So, uh, so I would usually go and uh, experience, try to experience everything from a fan's perspective, and then from that point, see if there's uh, a design that I can create that will satisfy that uh, that fandom. So I'm I'm definitely a, a fan of the Halloween franchise now because I've gotten really into it. Well, you know your first game. I mean, we'll call a spade a spade. The the first trick or treat game was pretty small comparatively. Um, after that, you moved up. I think your second game was Vault. Yes, that's correct. But somewhere in the midst of that, you started designing games for other companies. How did that come to be? Oh, okay. So I started off as a, a publisher. So the, the funny thing is that when I was getting into this industry, I wanted to get into the industry. I thought my path into the industry was to be a publisher. So I actually started off as a publisher. I published my uh, first two games, and I thought that I would actually be approaching other designers to license their designs to, to publish under my company. 
And so I actually just designed two games, mostly to show, to demonstrate that I can, I understand the publishing process and hopefully build a rapport so that other designers would, um, you know, I can approach designers to uh, license their designs. So, um, but at a, at a certain point, I had met uh, Colby Duck and yourself, uh, and the things took a turn when uh, Colby had convinced me that I actually had some skill in, in game design. And, uh, and both you and Colby had really um, opened my eyes to the, the possibility of like, you know, designing games uh, for other publishers. So because until then, I, I was really of the mindset that I, I don't have the skill to design games. So I was, uh, I was kind of hacking or uh, some, I was just trying to uh, come up with some games just to show that I can publish games. So, uh, so yeah, that's how I transitioned from going from self-publishing to uh, publishing games. So my, my third game was Spectrops, which was published by Plat Hat Games. Yeah, that still makes me sad. Emerson showed me Spectrops and his uh, fourth game, which was, um, uh, was Crossfire, yeah. on the same day. And at that time, I didn't really know Emerson that well. I just knew that he had designed a game and would show me some new ones. And I said, I'll put both of these in Dice Tower Essentials tomorrow. But he said that Colby already had them. So, Colby, I will never forgive you for that. <laughs> All right. So, after that, though, I mean, Crossfire, uh, not Crossfire, uh, but Spectrops gave you some cred. A lot of people started knowing your name from that. But the game that really put you on the map there was was Century, um, Spice Road. And then yes. now you have the back-to-back -back almost million-dollar Kickstarters with uh, Foundations of Rome, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. and now companies vie for you to design a game for them. So... It's just an interesting trajectory because most people start as a designer and then turn into a publisher as a side thing, and you've you've done the opposite. Yes, I, I think that my approach has been very atypical. I don't think a lot of people um, who are who want to be designers start off as publishing, but uh, but initially I really didn't think I had the talent to to design. I didn't have the right mindset or expertise or discipline to be able to design. So. All right, well, Eric's internet died, so he is, uh -oh. he'll be back in a bit. But meanwhile, I'm going to jump ahead a little early to the big question because I really like this concept. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about this, and I need to find my little thing here. But today's discussion question is, what is table presence? How does a game achieve it? And is it possible to go too far? Because this directly affects both of us in the sense of Foundations of Rome specifically. So Foundations of Rome, when Emerson first showed me his first prototype of the game, and there's a long backstory of how the game came about, but when he, you got the final de design or you know basic 90% of it, right. it was on a little sheet of paper <laughs> with some paper cards and little paper pieces that Emerson had cut out. And when the Arcane Wonders design team showed me the big giant square box that it would be in, I was under the assumption that they were just making a joke. And I argued strongly against making such a monstrosity thing, except that people loved it. Again, not only did it make a million dollars, it made almost another million dollars the second time around. And people were running at conventions, and everyone commented on how amazing this game looked. At the same time, that's a pretty big, giant game. So what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Well, um, let's go with your first question, which is, what is table presence? And um, I... <laughs> I was tempted to be cheeky and define it as like the amount of actual volume the game and, and its components will actually <laughs> that's display a math answer. <laughs> on the area above the, the table surface, but, but that's not going to help. That, does, that definition doesn't help anyone. Uh, but I'm, I think of table presence as uh, the draw of a game to people who are observing or playing the game. Right? 
So what it, what is it that's drawing them to the table? What is it that's appealing to them both visually and tactily is, is sort of how I'm defining it. And it's one of those th- terms that's open to definition, o- open to interpretation because it is uh, something that I think, you know, is, is a fairly recent uh, discussion point about table presence. Uh, especially in in our age of like these grandiose Kickstarters and a uh, very um, very well produced miniatures components, uh, the artwork. I think that if you look at games from 10, 20 years ago, I think that the aesthetics of games uh, has just you know uh, evolved in leap by leaps and bounds. Right. Um, and I think your second question was, how does a game achieve it? Uh, and this is definitely this is definitely not my area of expertise. The foundations of Rome, uh, the the structure, the framework, the the product design, it was everything done by Arcane Wonders, and they're the one that had the vision to create something like this as as a product. So, um, yeah, the I mean, strangely enough, games can just take up more volume and that'll elevate its table presence, right? So. Um, but you know, there's there's other parts of it, such as like the art, the the aesthetics, the composition, the uh, the overall cohesiveness of all the the pieces, iconography. There's there's lots of things that can impact uh, the the presence or people's perception of the game while it's on the table. So, but I wouldn't be the the best person to ask about what would make a game um, increase its table presence. Yeah, but I think that we can agree that a table presence cannot elevate a bad game into a good one. No matter how right. good a game looks, it's not going to look better. I mean, it's not going to play better because it looks better. Yeah, I think gameplay and table presence are two independent metrics for a game. Sure, but okay, but as a gamer, are you, does that affect you? Because I've had people tell me, I don't care, I could play just on paper and I would be fine. And I couldn't. I mean, if that was the only thing we had, I guess, right? But you give me a choice between a game that's, you know, just a bunch of paper and, you know, note cards and a game that looks beautiful, I want to play the more beautiful one. But some people don't care about that. Yes. So, I mean, there's going to be some psychology involved here where uh, people's experience with the game isn't just for the mechanics. Uh, It's not strictly how the components feel or the artwork or the theme, but it's more like the the gestalt total of all those factors will play into how the uh, how the player experiences the, the game. So, you know, table presence is just one aspect of it. You have gameplay, the aesthetics, the tactile feel. There's so many things that go into uh, a player's experience. So. Um, the other day, uh, or actually this was about two weekends ago, I was playing uh, Century, A New World, and in, in there, there was a couple of things that were kind of souring uh, my experience. And normally I don't talk negatively, but it's my own game, so I can talk neg- neg- a little negatively <laughs> about it. But it's those, I was just irked with those meeples, how tiny they were, how hard it is to see how many there are total across the board, picking them up, handling them that you know, it's, it certainly is conceivable that something like that, especially if you have big hands, it is going to be such a negative experience to you trying to handle those kind of components that it is going to color your overall experience of it. It certainly did color mine, too, because while um, I generally make games that I also enjoy playing, but you know, having components um, and also seeing uh, some of the graphics were a little hard to see. All those little things do uh, have an influence on your overall experience. So, yeah, I actually I wanted to make bigger meeples for that game, but then they also chose very unusual colors for them, so you can't just replace them with ye generic meeples. By the way, welcome back, Eric, from the land of lost Hi. internet. Yeah, it looks like uh, the entire internet just died at my house, so we had to flip some switches and restart everything. But I'm sure I I missed some wonderful discussion, and I I didn't want to just jump in because I didn't know what you talked about already. Well, we're talking about Um, giant games. Emerson's being very nice, but I want to know about Foundations of Rome here. Like, what were your initial impressions when you saw the size of it, and what are your impressions now? I actually had the 
identical reaction to you when they showed me the box, I thought it was also a joke as well. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize that they were serious about making something that big. Or, um, you know, generously, I thought that it was something that they were thinking about as sort of like a deluxe version of it, like a hyper deluxe version. Think of Takenoko, the deluxe version that comes in that wooden box for $300 with this gigantic panda. Yep. Something, something like something akin to that, but not the main product that was going to be on Kickstarter, but a deluxified version that they may offer uh, as part of a campaign for a more reasonably sized product with a, a more reasonable price point for it. So, but yeah, that was my my initial reaction. Um, I know that it was. It was something that I think it stirred a little bit of controversy in terms of like what is what do you ex, what do people expect from a, an expensive Kickstarter? Does it have to have a ton of miniatures? Does it have to have complicated rules, uh, lots of interchangeable modules, things like that? So I think it was uh, something that is pushing the pushing people's expectations. Like it's definitely um, you know making people question what what you you should expect from Kickstarters like these. Do you think it was important to get eyes on this particular game that this uh, may have just been lost in the shuffle if it wasn't such a dramatic presence on the table? Yeah, that's a really that's a really really good question. I'm yeah, you know, it's it's one that I don't have the answer to. I don't know if it was the production of it that was really bringing it to the forefront, and. Uh, and the gameplay was good enough to where it didn't disappoint, and therefore it was uh, a product that people really enjoyed. Overall, when you see it as an, an entire package, um, but I, there was a lot of um, criticism to that too. There were a lot of criticism saying that the game was too light to justify the components and the cost of the Kickstarter, and so forth. But I'm generally of the mind that like if you don't agree with the product offering, you just don't buy it. You know, there was a lot of people that were being very, very vocal about it. And um, and I've always found it, it very, very interesting. It's a very interesting culture uh, that we live in where uh, it's not enough for you to say that you don't like something, but you want to dissuade others from it, too. <laughs> we do live in an era, though, where I am starting to get concerned about the the size of games and the each game needing to be bigger than the last. I don't know if you all saw the picture of the new Heroes Skate box, but it is, and I'm oh, not yeah. exaggerating, like this wide and this tall, and it's a long box that I don't know what shelf it's going to fit on. And um, it's a $250 product. Yeah. Right. And then we have, like Simon made, um, Death May Die with the Cthulhu figure that literally blocks you from seeing the other side of the table when you're playing on it. And the Everdell box, which is bigger than Twilight Imperium 4th edition. Um, I wonder, like, at some point there will be some Edsel made. Some game that's made that is so over the top ridiculous that people just say enough is enough. I mean, there's, there's got to be one that stops it, right? Well, I, I think to go for, with your last que part of the question is, like, can you go too far with this? And everyone has like a different threshold of what is too far. And I know Foundations, just from reading comments, you know, Foundations has already gone too far for, uh, you know, a group of folks out there. So is it possible to go too far? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely possible to go too far with it. But um but whether you know Simon or any company wants to create these extravagant products, you know I don't have I don't particularly see that as a, a problem. Well, uh, you know, unless you look at it from the perspective of like plastic production and you know your carbon footprint and so forth. But you know putting that as a different you know that could be its own topic. But having things uh, that are these you know very large uh, components, uh, this gigantic you know the boxes can get bigger and bigger. And so forth, but uh, I'm of the mind that if you know if there's people that are willing to to buy it, and they're willing to back it. That this is the kind of product that they want, right? Uh, it's certainly not for me. Uh, I have a limited amount of space, so I'm very conscious of of what uh, how many games I can actually buy and the size of those games. 
but not everyone is has the same constraints. So if someone wants to, uh, you know, get the latest HeroScape and you know, have this gigantic box that they can, you know, use as a bed, you know, all, more power to them. Uh, but I think you know, if it gets to a certain point where it just becomes over extravagant, then the that threshold of going too far is when you're no longer able to, you know, get people to get excited about this product because you've just gone too too far. Right? So the farther you go, the 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 your market's going to be dwindling, and I think that is just a normal your normal uh, negative feedback loop in a sense. I do think though that. Sometimes table presence is actually bad for a game when the table presence detracts from the game experience. Uh, so an example of this would be they just came out with a, um, was it called Serengeti? Uh, it's a game that has like a 3D thing that holds the round marker, but you can't see it from all the different angles. Another good example would be a game I just talked about, Everdell. The tree... Mm. The holds tree. everything, yeah. but if you're, you, it requires everybody to sit in an awkward way if you want to use that tree. And there's a lot of times there's these 3D components that people go, you know what, we're just going to put everything on the table. But just because something looks cool doesn't mean it actually helps make the game better. <laughs> agreed, agreed. I think Foundations also has a little bit of this problem that if you're, uh, if the table is either raised fairly high or your seating position is fairly low, Sometimes the buildings could obscure what lots are available or some of the smaller buildings. So, yes, absolutely. The, um, the components themselves, you know, being produced extravagantly could, you know, also impact its usability. So I think in, in my mind, when I generally design or if I were to publish again, I would always put usability before table presence. What about when the game is so large it doesn't fit on most tables? Is there like a regular sized, a normal sized table, quote unquote, that you are aiming for when you're you're trying to figure out how big you can go? <laughs> my my rule of thumb has always been X wing. So X wings on a three by three uh, mat. So therefore, I don't have. I try not to make any games that exceed a four foot by four foot square area, total area. So I try to keep it within a three foot by three foot uh, area if possible. I think that's too big, actually. I'm with you on the one three, but the other three, a lot of tables only have two feet or two and a half feet. Yeah, you can't play X swing on those. <laughs> well, you can. But I do, I do I try have. to make it to where it's a, it's, it's not necessarily that it requires three foot in both dimensions, but the components can be arranged in a way where it will take nine square feet. Ah, if that makes sense. okay. Nope, nine square feet is good. I like that. All right, well, we got a lot as a of... designer, though, I have very limited, uh, limited say in terms of what actually gets produced, though. Well, we have a lot of questions for you, both pre-questions and questions in the chats. So we better get started. Eric, what's our first question? Let's start with someone named Ferg, who asks, you have such an ability to distill a game down to its core mechanisms in order to maximize fun with seemingly simple rule sets. What's your process for streamlining your games? Oh, well, thank you, Ferg. Um, That's almost for, asking, for that. like, what makes like, a game fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I some of it I do it out of necessity just because I am terrible at writing complicated rules. So I, it's it's definitely my Achilles heel. I'll say compli like writing rules, especially for complicated rules, has always been very difficult for me. So, uh, but the in terms of the process, uh, when I first started off like designing games, I found that, you know, game design you know, was using like different parts of my brain. But the more I've designed games, the more I realize that there's a lot of similarities between uh, game design and software development, uh, believe it or not. So the more I design that Venn diagram of those two start to overlap more and more and more. And so I take a very, now I take a very similar approach to uh, game design as I did with software development, where you determine what the end result, end result should be, and you try to find the least complicated path to achieve those desired results. And you would iterate to try to find the, you know, you can take certain blocks of code or game me mechanisms, and you will test it to see if it produces the desired results. And then you can use different combinations of mechanisms or different APIs, you know, 
to trying to achieve those results. So, and then you would, uh, I, I'm, my natural inclination is to always go with the least complicated route. So I think it's also one of the reasons I'm really picky with uh, heavy euros uh, because I, I look closely at each mechanic and I try to give it something called the weight test. So uh, each mechanic, uh, I try to determine if its inclusion uh, you know, carries enough weight to justify its cognitive and rules load. And so what I find with a majority of uh, like the very heavy euros is that there's a lot of components in there that don't pass this weight test. So not to say that I don't enjoy heavy euros, but I'm very, very picky about them because a lot of them do have a lot of components that just don't carry its weight. So and yes, there is sort of like a fun factor. Each component needs to provide a certain amount of enjoyment to like justify its inclusion in the game. Do you have an example of a heavy game that has a nice streamlined rule set that you like? Oh, Concordia, I think, is a great example of that. All right. So Concordia is, is a heavier game. Uh, I think it is incredibly, incredibly elegant. Moving on to a question from Joe. There were actually several people that wanted to know more about the Century Trilogy, uh, but Joe sort of distilled this really well. Uh, could you go into a little about the Century Trilogy and how that came to be? Did you have an initial idea to make games that could be combined, or did that come after the fact, for example, as you were starting to design another game? And would you do it again, a series of linked games? <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, this was, this was a great question. Um, so when I created Century, the first game, when it was announced, I did not have the other two games designed yet. Uh, and so once they announced it, then I was committed to creating the second and third game. A uh, funny story was that when I was approached to create these games, they said that they were looking for uh, mixable games. And it was a term that I was not familiar with. So uh, I was too embarrassed to ask what is a mixable game. So I just came up with my own definition of what it should be. So uh, so yes, it definitely didn't start off as a, as a trilogy of games or di different designs with interlinking components. It is something that came out of that whole process. And would I do it again? Uh, yes, because I'm already uh, working on another project with interlinking components oh, and so forth. Tell us more. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to. I can, <laughs> I can tease it. So, well, then we should move on to something that you can talk about. Well, no, no, no. Hang, on, hang on, hang on, you can't okay, leave this question. Right, right. You can't leave this question that fast because I want to know of this trilogy. Did, did you, I, I know from previous conversations that you did not have the entire thing planned out at the beginning. Correct. So, of the games, which one are you most, do, do you think they got better as they went along? Do you like the first one better? Is there a certain combo? Because there's six different ways to play the game, and I'm curious which one you like the best. Oh, okay. Well, I think the first one is probably the one I'm proudest of because it is uh, it is really just a single mechanism distilled to um, what I think is like the best I can do with that mechanism. So, and then each of the other games is really just really on the foundation of the first one. So it's almost like they're in in my mind they act a little bit like an expansion to the first one, but it's a standalone playable game in and of itself. But it uses a different mechanism from the other two games. All right, you heard it here. Emerson says the first one's the best. <laughs> it sells the best if that if that means anything. <laughs> sure. Uh, so moving on to Lori's question, this is uh, we alluded to at the beginning of the show. Can you give us any sneak peek info on the upcoming Persona Five card game from Pandasaurus, which was announced? Uh, have you played the video game? I'm guessing yes. And if so, who is your favorite character? Oh, those are those are all fantastic questions. Uh, let me go with the have I played the the video game. When I was first approached by Pandasaurus, I had not. It was on my list of uh, games that I absolutely wanted to play because it was a very it, you know uh, it was touted as like the best JRPG. Uh, so I was already Wait, very curious to to play. It's a JRPG. I did, I it is a JRPG in the in the similar vein as like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. Oh. I'm, in, I'm more interested now. Now Tom's in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it is. It is a very unique one because it comes. Uh, the video game is from the perspective of like a second year high school student. 
So in a way, it's a, it's a little bit of a life sim. So it's like there's half of the game which is like your life sim, and then the other half of the game is your you know GRPG combat uh, and things like that. And the the interesting uh, aspects of it is it's all kind of tied to psychology as well. It's Jungian psychology where you have your personas and you have your shadows, and that's where the name persona comes from. Was that is that we all have our personas, and we also all have our shadows as well. So when I first um, was approached uh, to do this project, I had never played the game. So, and this was back in June, I had spent two months and about 147 hours to get through my first playthrough of the game. Whoa. And the, and the, in the first 30 hours though, uh, when I was playing the first 30 hours, it was from the perspective of a high school student. And in my mind, I really felt that it was, I was not in the target audience for this. Like I'm not, uh, a young teenager and this is really meant for that audience but the more i played it the more i became enamored with the story the characters uh with you know the uh with the systems the leveling up process like the and especially the story the story was probably the strongest thing about how you're able to um connect with other people socially help them with their problems uh and it was a really interesting and different take and that JRPG genre, whereas most of them are really uh, very epic, grandiose scale. Uh, and in this one, you're you're playing as a high school student trying to uh, change evildoers out there. So hmm. when it comes to the gameplay, so the first part of Lori's question, so when it comes to the gameplay, uh, I can't go into too many details, but I, what I can tell you is that it is a fully cooperative card game, and each player is going to take the role of one of the Phantom Thieves, or one of the characters that you can play. So that includes Joker, Skull, uh, Panther, Mona, Fox. So basically the uh, the characters that you that come in battle with you. So, and a majority of the game is going to be played where you are tackling what's called palaces. So it, the palaces are kind of like their term for like a dungeon. So. Uh, but because they specifically asked for a card game, uh, so it's not going to be a dungeon crawling game with tiles and miniatures and things like that. It is just going to be uh, a card game. But uh, there were a couple of other things that they said that uh, that the fans would really like, so I put in extra effort to include them. One was the Velvet Room, which I know if you don't haven't played any Persona games, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but it is. Uh, but if you play Pokemon, it's kind of like. A place where you can like evolve your Pokemons in a way. So I don't know if that means anything. Uh, I know Eric, you you you're a Pokemon uh, player. Sure, absolutely. I, I always want to evolve my Pokemon, so yes. I'm in. <laughs> and then the the other aspect was just the the life aspect to it too. So the part of the life where you're playing as like a teenager, uh, you're doing your part time jobs. You know, you are cleaning your room, doing your laundry, all all of those. All of those things that you, it sounds incredibly mundane, but there's like a, there's some, something very satisfying about doing that in this game. So, uh, and in terms of my favorite characters, my God, I love all of the characters. Um, so if I had to pick one, it might be Ryuji because that character's made me laugh a lot. And he was he was such a great comic relief. Uh, but in this game, you can also have love interests too. So if I were to pick. A favorite love interest that one's easy that is futaba sakura which is she's sort of like the introverted shy gamer girl so uh so that's the one that like i really gravitated towards and um in in this game you can have multiple love interests but uh you know i was definitely futaba all the way um and i'm on the second place <laughs> you're not selling me on it I'm anymore to... <laughs> you had me now you're losing me <laughs> i'm sorry so yeah, so those those are all to answer the the question. Those are my favorite characters. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you had him for a minute. Um, all right, let's uh, let's ask some questions from chat if anyone has que questions here. But Nick wants to know how has the way you play games recreationally changed since becoming a designer? Can you play a game without looking at it through designer glasses? Oh, okay. Um, it, it is possible to play a game without uh, having that designer mindset of like dismantling the, the game. Uh, but that's also a sign of a good game is if it turns that part of my brain off and I'm sitting there in the moment playing the game. So, But for the most part, I do 
even even games that I'm really enjoying, I do still try to dissect it, see what makes it tick, you know, where is the fun coming from, uh, and so forth. So I don't know if I can turn that side uh, of my brain off anymore. Do you do does that? So I don't know. I mean, so that that, that doesn't affect your enjoyment of the game at all, though. I don't think it does. I don't think it does. Oh, okay. It's not a warning sign that if you start thinking that way, that okay, I'm not going to like this game. If I'm thinking, of, if I'm dissecting it, then that's mm. a problem because right. that happens even with games you like. <laughs> I think I think my enjoy it doesn't change my enjoyment, but I think now I'm able to explain better why certain mechanisms I enjoy and certain ones I don't. Do you have to think carefully though when you're playing a game like that that you don't accidentally use something from one game in one of yours? Hmm. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, well, I do feel like mechanisms aren't something that any particular designer owns. So sure. you know, I can, you know, I can clearly show uh, my inspiration in all of my designs. I can clearly show a uh, a clear line between the mechanisms and where they're inspired from. So, for instance, um, you know, I, a lot of keen listeners know that uh, Acquire was a big influence for Foundations of Rome. Sure. Uh, Sid Saxon's, Sid Saxon's uh, Bazaar was a big inspiration for uh, Century. Right. Okay. So you can see I'm, I'm a big Sid Saxon fan. So a lot of my designs probably stem from my enjoyment of his, his classic games. So um, going back to the, the original question, do I feel like... Uh, I may take. I'm, I'm afraid I might take some mechanisms I see in other games and incorporate them into my designs. Uh, not necessarily, because it is something that I see very common. Is that designers we do, um, you know, as new games come out, we add to sort of like a communal pool of mechanisms uh, that we can use, and so it it makes the it gives us a deep. Uh, pool of resources that we can use to drive designs. So it's like we're adding more and more tools that we can use. And that's sort of how I see uh, design and uh, mechanisms that I see in designs is that it's just expanding everyone's uh, tool set. So I'm not particularly concerned with using something I see in another game. Um, I try not to, I do consciously try not to lift it directly and just like take uh, mechanisms without changing the variables. Um, I know that deck building is one of those ones that it's is a good example in that a lot of deck builders use the same formula from Dominion, right? So the deck size is always twice your hand size and it, ha it contains a certain amount of this uh, and so forth. So I try, if I were to do deck building, I'd probably want to change more variables than just that to kind of explore because as a designer, one of the things that we really focus on is exploring design space. What variables can you change? What can you alter? And how? what kind of experience comes from those changes? All right, last question here is from Board Game Queens, and they want to know what's your favorite game of all time? Oh, that's a, that's a really tough one. That is a really, really tough one. I recently played Robinson Crusoe, so that's that's sticking to the forefront for me right now. But uh, doesn't that uh, break your rule about the complexity of rules? <laughs> well, su surprisingly, though, like each one of those elements does carry. Like for instance, you know, I look at Robinson Crusoe and I look at all the the moving parts. But I, I it's one of those games that I do feel like if I take one away, I I am going to miss it. Oh, okay. And I do feel like each thing. Uh, each component, uh, each mechanism does justify its existence in in the whole. How so, often have you won Robinson Crusoe? Uh, let's see. I've won of the 22 times that I've played it. I think I've won seven or eight times. Holy I've cow! That's actually he's a liar. Good. Eject him from this podcast. No one has even <laughs> won that many times ever. So. So since we're on the topic of Robinson Crusoe, let, let me mention one thing, though. The rule book does say that you could take Friday, you could take the dog, there's a bunch of characters you could take. So all the people who are complaining on BGG that the game is too hard, there are options. It's your choice whether you want to forego those options, but don't complain it's too, too difficult if the options are there. The designer says you can do this. He even gives you a spyglass that you can tear just to get a little bit of an advantage. So the options are there if you want to play on hard mode. 
right? <laughs> so if you play a video game and you put it on hard mode and you complain that it's hard, right, then that's on you, right? Well, I would part. argue that this game is not one that you're setting on hard. This is a game that's already set on hard. It's and you're just, way, yeah. you have to physically yes. go it, change it, it to easy. Where, you yeah. have to admit defeat and say, I need to back off and make this a simpler game. Yes, yes. I think that's hurting egos, and that's why there's there's a lot of people who complain about that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Robinson so, Crusoe it is, will hurt your ego. Yes, it, but it is definitely winnable. It is definitely winnable. So you may need a little bit of help from Friday, or you may need the dog, but it is definitely winnable. <laughs> well, I know I've won it. I just don't think 7 out of 22 times. I don't know, guys. I don't know. That's really good. Oh, uh, I do. I do have a little trick. Two players, I find, is a sweet spot for Robinson Crusoe. Well, that I agree okay. on for sure. All right, let's move on to talking about some games. Uh, not that we haven't already. We call this one and one. Uh, we're we're talking about a game that that would be considered new and a game that would be considered an older title. Uh, so, Emerson, why don't you go first with your new game you've been playing recently? Okay, well, I talked about Persona 5. That was my, the least, uh, most recent video game that I had played. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a tabletop game, and that is Twin Palms, the card game. So this is a trick-taking game. Uh, it is a, I, I got it because it is a family-friendly trick-taking game, but it has been a huge hit with the gamer crowds that I play with. Uh, so it is a very fun uh, trick-taking game with bidding. And betting, and I've just been having a blast playing this. So I just played this uh, a couple nights ago, and it's one that I keep taking out. I didn't know this was cool. even out yet. Um, oh, uh, I was a I was a Kickstarter backer, so I, I may have received an earlier copy. Ah, uh, it looks great. I'm very much looking forward to giving this one a whirl. I like the just the way all the cards look and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for my group, the advanced mode seems to be the sweet spot. So we haven't delved into the extreme yet, but advanced seems to be our sweet spot. We really enjoy that. I'll have to give it a whirl. Cool. cool. Uh, so my new game is uh, the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. This is the fourth of the Renegade Hasbro series. They're not really related, but they're, they're all Hasbro uh, deck building games, which are all different. Uh, they all have different mechanisms. This one is straight co-op. A uh, cooperative game where you're trying to build your deck to take down threats um, that get nastier the more uh, time goes by. Each turn you put a, sort of a cloud token on a threat and uh, you need to defeat it, usually through the acquisition of these sugar cubes, these multicolored plastic cubes uh, that you will acquire. And sometimes one player needs to have a bunch of a particular color. Sometimes all the players need to have a certain amount. Um, and you have to take down the major threats. I think it's three or two small threats and one big threat um, before you you lose out and, uh, and and don't make it through the scenario. Um, it is for being as cartoony as it looks. Uh, it is certainly just as complicated as the other Renegade deck builders. Um, it in fact the the rule book is practically a wall of text. It's it's a really solid chunk of rules. Um, but even with that, it seems a little flat. Like almost every one of the bad guys is um, is collect a certain number of cubes, connect three or collect three blue cubes and you defeat it. Collect three green cubes and you defeat it. And I, I'd like to see some more variety in the baddies. Um, there are expansions coming, so usually they start very simple with these things. But as it is right now, it hasn't quite grabbed me. The uh, My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck. Building. Who's the audience for this, Eric? I. Uh, I will. I, if you were watching My Little Pony, what Friendship is Magic, that was like 10 years ago. So the eight year olds at that point are now 18, 20s. That's that's the uh, audience, I think, for this game is young adults who watched My Little Pony growing up. So it wouldn't be good for my nine year old daughter. Not to play alone. I don't think it's something that would be incomprehensible, but you would not want to just hand this to a nine year old and say, good luck. This mm -hmm. needs to be a little bit more of a guided onboarding experience, to use a term that Erica used uh, on our last episode. Hmm. Feels like it should be a kid's game. and Because I don't think I could bring this one out, say, in my gaming group and get... Well, I, I probably could get people to play it, but I think they would do so under duress. 
I, I, think of it as the same level of complexity as the others in this series, the Transformers, the G.I. Joe and the Power Rangers. It's that level. Yeah, those just are, because it well, has also a more... had they started writing good rule books yet? Because so far, the their rule books for this series have been pretty bad. There, this one is it's clear, but it's just a solid block of text. I didn't have any rules issues with the rule book, but it's a lot to go through. Alrighty, my new one is called Tiny Turbo Cars. This is from Horrible Ooh. Guild. And this is a game that is a programming racing game. Not particularly a new category, but what's new in this one is, if you remember when you were little and you went to that house for Halloween, instead of giving you candy, they gave you a little slide puzzle that was a 16 <laughs> grid and you moved one, you moved uh -huh. around until you solved it. I like those slide puzzles. That's what this game is. Literally the game is, you have the slide puzzle, everyone says go, you start moving it around to whatever you want. You will use only the middle two rows for your commands for your car. As soon as you're happy, you grab a token. Once all the tokens are done, everyone counts down 10 for the last person. And then each person in order follows the programming on those um, little doodad things that they moved around. Wow. I feel like I'm pretty decent at moving those things around. I was a kid. I was a, kid, I was a pretty good whiz at solving them and stuff. You know what, though? Mixing that with programming, I don't know that there's like, is there anyone who would ask for that? I, I'm, I'm confused as to the, you know, the Venn diagram of people who wanted a speed game mixed with programming mixed with this. And because they made these... The biggest problem with the game is they made these things the exact same as those old ones are. And I don't know if you remember how hard it was sometimes to move it. If yeah. you didn't move the square over completely, you couldn't move one down. It's the same thing. And then it's just kind of like Mario Kart. You move around, shoot a missile or two, and it just it, it lacks a little bit of action. The actual game is pretty flat after all that. There's a few so obstacles on the track. When you're sliding the things around, you, you said you're using the middle columns. Do they need to be in order? So it's like Robo Rally where you move forward and then you move left and you turn. Yeah, I'm and... sorry. It's the middle rows, not the middle columns. But yes. Um, so like it might say, I might play a go forward, then a diagonal forward left, then a diagonal forward right, then a jump, then a shoot, then a regain in energy, then go backwards. I don't know why you would use that one. Then whatever. There are actions like that. It looks but cute. they all have to be in order when you're when you're done sliding it around. They need to be in the proper sequence. They do, because if you hit okay. walls, you lose energy. If you lose all your energy, your card crashes, and then you skip your next three actions, and you keep going. So you're going to keep moving, but there are definitely turns where you go, oh, bump, bump, bumpity, bump, 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 as you keep hitting the wall. <laughs> because you, Bumper cards. again, as you... You know, do this thing as fast as you can. Some, it's hard. It's hard to do something fast in programming and get it right. Mm. I wanted to like this one more than I did. It was okay. So Emerson, what uh, older title have you played recently? Okay. Well, um, I know I wrote down two, but I'll go with the I'll go with the older one here because I think I talked about Robinson Crusoe already. Uh, the other one is uh, Agricola. So Agricola is a game that I've uh, actually like fell in love with again. So I had played it many, many years ago and uh, I had enjoyed it, but it wasn't one that uh, like blew me away. But the but it was up on Board Game Arena and I've been playing with some friends on there. And uh, I think after about 75 games, I have to say that I am really enamored with Agricola. It is a fantastic uh, worker placement game. It's one of the originals and it was one of those games that it used to be number one on Board Game Geek for a while and now I, I see that there's good reason for that. It is, uh, you know, when you get when you get into it, so after the dozens of plays, you can really get into it and really start to appreciate the combinations of all the different minor and major improvements and your occupations and just seeing like all the different combinations has really like opened up that game to me so it, that's definitely one that i highly recommend people uh check out again that's agricola emerson is a way better designer than i am however 
You should not check out Agricola. Play Caverna. I just recently <laughs> played Caverna, and I will probably never play Agricola again. I think Caverna is mm. better in so many ways because it's smoother, has fewer rules. Everything Emerson says a game should do. That is true. That is true. But some of those occupation cards and those combos, there's something There's something about it. No, I get there's, it. I know why people like that one better for sure. Um, but I I, I, mean, I, I, love, like, I love Caverna as well. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying that Agricola is better than Caverna, uh, but it is definitely the older one. So uh, funny thing is that as I was trying to come up with my older game, I was looking up the timelines. And I, I looked at Robinson Crusoe and I said, oh, that's 2013. That's not old enough. Uh, so I wrote. I even wrote down Othello, and I said, "Okay, Othello is definitely old." Enough. Sure. <laughs> if Othello is not old enough, then we, we've gone wrong. Yeah. Although my daughter absolutely loves Othello, she'll come to me and ask me to play Othello. So get yeah. the corners. Well, my, get the corners. <laughs> exactly. She's starting to learn the heuristics of it now. So now she knows. Get to the edges. Get to the corners. So. So for me, uh, I, I got to try out Salem 1692 recently. This is one that I hadn't played. It's a social deduction game uh, that's that's themed after discovering the witches in Salem. Um, it has a little bit of a flavor of good cop, bad cop. You have a row of cards in front of you, and some of them, seated based on the number of players, will say witch. Most of them, however, say not a witch. There's also a constable in there. Um, and you are uh, trying to discover where the witch is, as long as you're not the witch, and then you're trying to uh, take out all of the non-witches. Um, and it has a little bit of a, a structure to it. There's like a the night phases where the witches can act against the other players don't happen until you work your way through a deck, so there's a lot of gameplay of discovering people's cards and peeking at their stuff and, and playing take that sort of things on each other. And then a night phase comes and the witches act and sort of spread their, their witchiness everywhere uh it was a good time i enjoyed it i i tend not to like social deduction games that much but this one um i i sort of liked how it had a structure to it it wasn't just blind accusation um and uh it was it was a good time that's salem 1692 all right then real quick i played another game from horrible guild called dungeon fighter this is a very silly game that i like <laughs> and i'm terrible at i've never won it i don't care Cooperative dungeon crawl, but you are bouncing dice off a table onto a target um, to hit monsters. And they just came out with a revised version of it, which has streamlined a lot of the rules from the original one. But this is one of those games that's ridiculous, and yet I really enjoy it. I like the, the weapons, because the weapons make it harder to throw the die. Like, you have to drop it off your head onto the table. But it does an extra two points of damage, so I'll probably use it, right? <laughs> Except you always miss with that. But I don't know. It's silly fun, and everyone I played it with, I shouldn't say everyone, many of the people I played it with have enjoyed it. Some have hated it with Beyond Burning Passion of a Thousand Suns, but it's one that it's, I like. It's a very silly game, for sure. All right. Well, we've reached the end of, of another episode, everybody. Emerson, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, oh, thank you for having me. If people want to find out more about what you are up to, what your latest designs are, or, or your classes at NYU, where do they go for more information? Oh, they can enroll in NYU. So that's <laughs> nyu.edu. Step one. <laughs> Or uh, I'm, I'm not very good at social media, but uh, I do have a Twitter, which is at NASCA Games. That's about it. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing your upcoming games, but especially looking forward to the Halloween game. Um, thank you. But thanks so much for coming on, Emerson. We appreciate it as always. Folks, thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. And I'm Eric Summer. We'll see you soon at the table. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you again in two weeks when our guest will be president of Arcane Wonders, Robert Geislinger. At the Table is produced by Tom and me with assistance from Roy Kennedy, Wendy Yee, and Chris Yee. That time the gerbils took over when the beavers went on holiday brought to you by Hamsterdam. And support for everything at the Dice Tower comes from viewers and listeners like you. Reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter or to Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com. Until we see you again from all of us at the Table, have, have fun, fun gaming. gaming. <laughs>